look at energy change in chemical reactions, which forms part of the chemistry syllabus. So firstly, we need to know that when a bond is broken, we absorb energy and when a bond is formed, we release energy. So if we look at 2H2 gas plus O2 gas, we form 2H2O gas. Now, the bond between hydrogen atoms will break in our H2 molecules and the bond between our oxygen atoms will break in our O2 molecules. And new bonds will form between our H atoms and our O atoms to form H2O gas. Now, in this process, when we break our bonds between our hydrogen and our bonds between our oxygen, we absorb energy. So energy is absorbed in the breaking of the bonds on the left between our reactants and energy is released in the form of bond formation between the atoms in H2O gas. This example over here, which is the same chemical equation as we see over here, we have 2H2 plus O2 um, forming 2H2O as we see over here. And you will be given information such as the above where they say that an H atom bonded to an H atom has 436 kilojoules per mole. The oxygen bond between two oxygen atoms has 496 kilojoules per mole and the OH bond has 460 kilojoules per mole. Now the easiest way to do this is to draw out what your bonds would look like. So as you can see your H2 bonds would be an H and an H. And remember that you have two of them, as you said, we've had two times. How O2 is a double bond, so we have O and O with a double bond, and we have one of those, and we form two H2O, so we, we draw out our H2O, and remember we have four times these because we have two, and we have two bonds within each molecule, and we have two moles of that, so we have four. Now we calculate what we will be required, so the energy we need that will be absorbed on the left will be two times four three six and one times four nine six we get that from here and that comes out to one three six eight and the energy released in our bond formation will be four times four sixty which is one eight four oh therefore overall we go our larger minus our bigger or the an easier way to do it is we always use the amount released minus the amount absorbed. So our amount released minus our amount absorbed equals 472 and therefore it is positive. So we have 472 kilojoules per mole released. Now, when we look at reactions, if we have a net energy released, so as in this example, we have 472 kilojoules released, we call this reaction exothermic and where we have a net energy that is absorbed, so where our bond formation and the release of energy is smaller than the amount of energy absorbed, we refer to that as an ex endothermic reaction. Sorry, we refer to that as endothermic, and one in which net energy is released, we refer to that as ex exothermic. So firstly, let's look at exothermic reactions. So as we've said, we have reactants that form products and energy, and this energy is released in the form of bond formations. So our delta H, which is our net energy change, is less than zero because the potential energy of the products is less than that of the reactants. Thermal energy is released and the reaction gets hotter. Now, if we look at the potential energy graph of this reaction, we have our reactants, which are sitting at a higher potential energy than our products. Remember that your delta H is always your difference between your reactants and your products where you go your products minus your reactants and therefore delta H is less than zero. We see that here. Remember that the amount of energy required to get to our activated complex is always your activation energy and the difference between your activated complex and your products is your energy released. So as we can see, less energy is absorbed in our activation energy than is released in the formation of our products and therefore more energy is released and this results in an exothermic reaction. When we look at endothermic reactions, we have reactants plus energy because we have energy that has to be inputted. We have a overall, we have energy input, not energy released, uh, forming products. Our delta H is greater than zero because the potential energy of the products is greater than that of the reactants. And thermal energy is absorbed and the reaction gets colder. So if we were to look at the potential energy graph, we have our reactants sitting lower than our products because our products have a higher energy level. 
we have our same activation energy, except our activation energy is now greater than our energy released because we have more energy absorbed than we have released. Our delta H is positive because when we go products minus reactants, that will be greater than zero because our products have a greater energy than our reactants. And our activated complex is where our reaction will take place. Now, it is good to note that your delta H, when you are asked to calculate that, is always your potential energy of your products minus your potential energy of your reactants. If it is negative, then your reaction is exothermic. And if your delta H is positive, then your reaction is endothermic, as shown over here. And in your exothermic reaction, we show it over here. Now, activation energy is this part of the graph over here. And this is the minimum energy required to start a chemical reaction. When we refer to activated complex, which is this point over here, the peak of the graph, this is the, the substance, which is the transition state between reactant and the product. It is high energy and unstable. So sufficient energy is required to overcome the strength of existing bonds. And that is in the form of input energy in the, that we need to break the bonds of our reactants. Now we look at the collision theory, which affects the rate of reaction and energy change in reactions. So chemical reactions occur when there are effective collisions between the reactants. Now the collision theory states that there must be an effective collision in order for a reaction to take place. We need two conditions in order for a effective collision to take place. We need sufficient energy. So in order to get sufficient energy, we can raise our temperature, which gives increased kinetic energy, as we show over here. And this increases the velocity, which gives increased sufficient energy. And secondly, we need correct orientation. Our atoms or molecules have to be correctly orientated in order for a successful collision to take place. Increasing the temperature increases the number of particles with enough energy to take part in the reaction. If we look at a graph such as this, we have a graph which shows our reaction at low temperature and a reaction at higher temperature. The higher the proportion of particles that are able to react gives a faster reaction. So if we look at the low temperature, we have an EA, which is the particles that will take part in the reaction. Anything right of this, particles will take part in the reaction, and left of this, they will not. We can see that the proportion of particles with sufficient energy to react is far larger in our high temperature graph. This is simply because particles have larger energy or greater energy and therefore have sufficient energy to react they are able to take part in successful or effective collisions. We can also see that with a catalyst, we are able to, so this would be our EA without a catalyst. We have far fewer in our low temperature graph and many more in our high temperature graph. And if we have an EA with a catalyst, we see that this moves left and therefore in both graphs, we have increased number of particles. But we will refer to how the catalyst affects this in in the next few pages so we know that a catalyst weakens the bond and lowers our activation energy so the activation energy with the catalyst includes more particles and therefore increases the reaction rate of the reaction so the rate of reaction reactants are used up and products are formed and the rate of the reaction refers to the speed of the reaction so if we look at a reaction such as a plus 2b equals um, a, B, 2, so these are products and these are reactants over here. The average rate we could measure in a number of ways. We could measure the amount of A used over time or the amount of B used over time or the amount of A, B, 2 produced over time. When you look at the amount of A, B, 2 produced, we plot it on a graph and we see that first it has a steep gradient at the start due to the fastest reaction rate. We have the greatest number of A and B at the beginning of the reaction and therefore our reaction rate is very fast due to increased amount of effective collisions because we have so many particles or concentration of particles. As the reaction goes on, our gradient decreases as the reaction slows because our reactants are being used up and therefore we have less effective collisions. Eventually our gradient becomes zero, which shows that our reaction has stopped because we have run out of reactants this is not a reversible reaction and therefore the reaction will run to completion. 
So the gradient is a measure of the rate of reaction and a tangent to this curve would be the instantaneous rate of the reaction at that point in time. When we look at the same reaction A plus 2B forming AB2, we look at the amount of each substance. We can see that A and B decrease. B Initially, there's more, more amount of B because we have 2 to 1, a ratio of 2 to 1. So our B initially starts with a greater amount. However, they both run to an amount of zero where the reaction has completed. Now, in some graphs, you may see that your products increase very quickly in the beginning and then start to slow down. The initial sudden increase is due to exothermic reaction, raising energy, and therefore your rate of reaction increases, leading to this very steep rise in the beginning. Remember, your gradient equals your rate, which is your amount over your time. And your slowing rate of the production of your product is caused by the collision theory. We have fewer molecules of your reactants and therefore fewer effective collisions, leading to a slowing rate of reaction. When we measure the rates of reaction, we have a number of ways we can do this. In When we deal with volumes of gas, we will measure the change in volume of gas, and this is suitable when one product is a gas. When one product is given off, then we'll measure a change in mass. When a precipitate is formed, we will measure the turbidity of the solution. And when there's a change in color, we will simply measure the change in color. We will place a solution on a white towel where we can easily view the change in color of the mixture. However, this is hard to plot on a graph because there's no measurement of color in, on a scale. So the rate of the reaction is determined by the nature of the reactants and the conditions of the reaction. So now we looked at factors affecting the rate of reaction and we have five different factors that will affect our rate. Firstly, our surface area. Then we look at temperature, concentration, pressure, which will only be used with gases, and lastly, a catalyst. When we look at surface area, crushing a solid into small pieces means that the surface area is larger which means more solid is exposed and this allows for more contact and greater chance for successful collisions. So as you can see, if we have a solid that is in one piece, we have less contact area than if we crush it. And therefore, by increasing our surface area, we increase the collisions and therefore increase our rate of reaction. When we look at concentration, an increase in concentration means there are more reactants per unit volume which allows for more successful collisions and therefore a greater rate of reaction. The same is true if you decrease your concentration, your rate of reaction will decrease because you have decreased your number of successful collisions. As we said, this, is, this explains why your rate decreases over time as reactants are used up as the concentration decreases. And that, as we said, indicates why in this graph we have a slowing down of the production of AB2. Then we look at pressure. So a decrease in volume causes increased pressure. More particles in a smaller area results in increased effective collisions and therefore an increased rate. The same is true if we increase our volume, then we would decrease our pressure. There are fewer particles in a, in a small area and therefore our effective collisions decrease and our rate of reaction will therefore decrease. When we look at temperature, a higher temperature results in greater kinetic energy. Our particles are moving faster and have more successful collisions. So if we increase our temperature, we increase our kinetic energy, particles move faster. And although not all collisions will be successful, as we have more collisions, the chance of successful collisions increases. So more particles with energy greater than the activation energy, and therefore we are likely to have more successful collisions and reactions on collision which leads to an increased reaction rate. Lastly, we look at a catalyst. So a catalyst firstly correctly orientates your molecules for reaction and it weakens your ex existing bonds. If you are ever asked to explain how a catalyst works, you simply state that a catalyst can be used to correctly orientate molecules and it is used to weaken existing bonds. So if we look at the potential energy graph of a reaction, we see that if we use a catalyst, our activation energy is much lower than it would be without a catalyst. However, we must always remember that our catalyst does not affect our delta H. The position of our products and our reactants will always be the same 
despite the inclusion of a catalyst. And if we look at the volume or the reaction rate graph of a reaction with a catalyst and without a catalyst, with a catalyst, it'll be much faster and will reach completion much earlier, say over here. And without a catalyst, it will be slower and will reach completion at a later stage. So if we look at this example over here, we have H2 plus I2 forming 2HI. This would be our normal graph over here, our rate of reaction over here, where we are measuring our HI formed. So this would be our reaction in red. If we increase our temperature, we increase our reaction rate and we reach completion earlier than we would in under normal circumstances. If we decrease our concentration of our reactants, our graph is lower, as you can see it ends lower because we have less reactants and therefore less products. So our concentration of HI is lower and we will have a slower reaction as we can see by the gradient due to the fact that there will be less effective collisions. If we increase our concentration, our graph ends higher because we have more reactants and therefore more products. And also our gradient will be much steeper than under normal circumstances because we have a greater concentration of reactants and therefore increased effective collisions, which lead to a greater rate of reaction and therefore a steeper gradient.